All righty. So here we are, week three. Um, here we go. Okay, so I feel like I should restart that, but we can't. It's already on. So here we are in week three. Welcome to Cycle Sync and Chisel. I had to originate myself there for a second. Um, this week, we are digging into the woman code protocol. And just to be clear, I did not create the woman code protocol. That is from Elisa Vitti, uh, the author of these two fantastic books. She first wrote this one, Woman Code, Women, excuse me, Woman Code. This is a fantastic book for anyone who has any cyclical symptoms. If you think you do, then most likely you do. This lecture, this talk will help identify those. We did kind of talk about them a little bit in week one. We did an overview. So we'll kind of discuss those again, but this is for anyone who thinks that they have any cyclical symptoms or that their hormones are slightly off. This is the place to start. This lecture, this workshop, not workshop, but this, um, this course will also give you a good indication of like what's going on and what steps to take. And that is all just because of this book, right? I'm basically summarizing what she's saying in this book. This book is the next step. This book is once you've found balance in your hormones, this is like true optimization. This is biohacking in a book for women, for women specifically, okay? Um, our objectives for today's talk are going to be to define the, the woman code protocol. It's a five-step process. So we'll go through what those five steps are. Over the next couple of weeks, we will break down each of those steps, okay? We'll go into the causes of hormonal imbalances. We'll talk briefly about hormone disruptors and flow blockers. These are things that are keeping you out of flow, okay? We will go through clues, signs, symptoms that your hormones are slightly off, like something's not going the way it should be. And then we'll go through some handouts um, and then you'll get a little bit of homework for this week as well. Okay, so the woman code protocol. Elisa designed this. It's a five-step protocol designed to address underlying causes of hormonal problems and to support the essential functions of your endocrine system so hormones can work in a healthy, balanced way. We all want that. We all want everything to be working the way it's supposed to, okay? I will say, even if you do go through the five-step protocol, if you find yourself living in sync with your cycle, you are still absolutely going to run into some hiccups. But once you understand the system and your system, so the protocol and your system, how your body works, how your hormones work, you are then able to troubleshoot and not fix, not put a bandaid on things, but to truly heal, right? Every, like think of a car, a car, will inevitably always have some type of issue. Something is always going to come up, right? You bring it to a mechanic who knows how to fix it. You are going to be your own mechanic. You're gonna know how to fix what's going on, okay? The five-step protocol has five steps. The first one is stabilizing your blood sugar. That's super important. Whether you are bleeding or not, so whether you're a child or in menopause, or currently bleeding, you need to know how to stabilize your blood sugar. If we could all learn how to stabilize our blood sugar, the world would be a better place. People wouldn't be getting hangry. Like we'd have like level heads more of the time. Um, we wouldn't binge. Things would be so much better. So, so, so much better. Supporting your adrenals, okay? Our adrenals are overworked. That's almost like I can confidently say that for most individuals, our adrenals are overworked. So with the five-step protocol, you learn how to stabilize or excuse me, how to support your adrenals, how to show them some love, how to kind of give them a little bit of a break or to provide them with exactly what they need to kind of like reboot throughout the day. And we will discuss that in today's discussion. Support your organs of elimination. We've touched on this over and over again. It's a passionate area for me because it's an area that I tend to need a lot of support in. Um, so we'll talk about that, what those signs and symptoms are, that something there is going wrong. And I believe it's in week, um, I believe in week seven, 
week seven, we do a deep dive into your organs of elimination. So in a couple more weeks, we'll really dig into that. Cyclosync, we've already gone over that. Okay, so that is part of this protocol. Elisa recommends that you start by stabilizing blood sugar, learn how to support your adrenals, check out your um, organs of elimination, see what needs help there, and then go into cycle syncing. I chose to start with discussing what cycle syncing was so that you had an overview of like th this kind of how this all comes together. Okay. And the last piece, originally her system was a four part system, but over time and after 10 years of working with individuals, with females, she learned that this missing piece was so many women were really out of touch with their feminine energy. So we all have feminine and masculine energies. And a lot of us operate in the masculine, which is not a bad thing. It helps us to get shit done for sure. But where is the softness? Where is the creativity? Where is the essence of being a woman, which again, like how many of us sit down and do crafts? How many, how many of us like have creative expressions that we like are truly like allowing ourselves to partake in, right? Um, maybe not just doing it once a month, right? Like, but like that is such a rich part of us and many of us don't partake in it. It could again be like creating meals. It could be crafting. It could be any type of art. It could be singing, but like this creative energy and also an energy of flow of not having everything mapped out, right? And, and really having that intuitive sense of like, what is it that I wanna to do today? Very difficult in a society that wants us to be on a schedule. So that's an uphill battle that we will always have to have to <laughs> face climb, however you wanna say that. Um, so what, what causes our hormones to actually become out of balance? If you take that five-step protocol, here it is, right? It's blood sugar regulation. It's not happening, right? Blood sugar is all over the place. Um, our adrenals are overworked. Our pathways of elimination become clogged, backed up. Uh, again, we start to, if we're seeing it on a skin, on the, the surface of our skin, we are three systems behind, right? Because it really starts with our, our liver is where it starts. And then it goes to our gut. And if any of those are backed up, right? If our liver isn't functioning properly, the gut isn't gonna be able to do what it needs to do. And the skin is the last layer of elimination. And that's where we start to see like, oh shit, something's off. Something's really off. Um, living, in, living life in ways that don't take your cycle into consideration, right? Again, we live on a set like man's schedule of like, this is how every day needs to look. We need to show up. We need to be this way every single day and not taking into consideration that flow. And then it's very closely related to operating out of this masculine energy all the time. Um, two other things, or I should say like really five other things or more than that, that also impact our hormones are going to be uh, the dirty dozen. There's probably plenty more than 12, but endocrine disruptors, right? That are around us everywhere. They're in our home. I know for a fact that I'm sure some are on my bed. They're in this notepad, believe it or not. Like they're everywhere, everywhere. I'm sure even blue light blockers have some type of endocrine disruptor in them. It's kind of wild. We'll go into that. Um, and then Elisa has created a list of four flow blockers, which we will discuss. Okay. Um, and here we are on those floor, uh, flow blockers, excuse me. So lack of knowledge and misinformation, cultural conditioning, environmental and lifestyle toxins, and of course our modern diet. So let's break each of these down. So misinformation, how many of us can actually identify the phases of our cycle. Maybe perhaps now that we're in week three, we have a better idea. And maybe we also did know prior to coming into this course, but I know for a fact that I didn't, and I'm 36, but for the longest time, I had no idea the phases of my cycle, nor what was happening in my cycle. And I even started this course on day one saying, I still don't know to a T exactly what's happening with my hormones. I'm continuing to educate, my, educate myself and to familiarize myself with what is happening, but I still don't have it entirely memorized. 
right? So if we don't know what's happening with our hormones, we probably also don't know. So let's rephrase that. If we don't know where our hormones are, we most likely do not know what's happening as a result of where those hormones are, right? We don't know, we're not recognizing or acknowledging the changes in our neurochemistry. We're not recognizing or acknowledging the changes in our physiology, right? If we don't know these things, we, we can't operate from a place of empowerment, right? We aren't taught these things. Something I really love about Elisa is from a young age, she had this like, she had this love, this desire to learn as much as she could about the human body in general. And she remember like she, she talks about her first sex ed class uh, and how when they talked about the male body in the textbook, it was like this big elaborate epic process. And then they go to talk about the female body and it's just like three sentences of basically you're going to produce an egg if the egg doesn't get, if it, the egg doesn't match with sperm, the egg is excreted and you have a period. And it just was like this very dull, rendition of really a pretty epic beautiful process even if you're not becoming pregnant but like how incredible the female body is and it just like totally skimmed over it right and so every single one of us was most likely taught that way um there was not like this like sex ed was like a day long or an hour long we'll say an hour long 45 minute discussion of what happens in the human body but there was no magic involved at all and if there was any any tint of magic it was you know shown on the male body not the female body okay um there's tons of myths about female cycles and that we are supposed to feel crappy that we're supposed to feel you know symptoms of pms that we're supposed to be moody we now know that that's actually false that's again misinformation it doesn't have to be that way um, and if we talk about, you know, two different spectrums here, menopause just has a very negative connotation about it. And Dr. Laura Bryden, she's another fabulous re resource. She considers menopause the second puberty. And I think that's a fantastic way to look at it of like, this is your chance to step into a new version of yourself, as opposed to like, there's this tale that it's like kind of the death of you, right? Like you're, you're, you're just getting closer to death. Her view is like, no, this is your second puberty. This is a new lease on life. Like, let's go into this with as much education and knowledge as prepared as we can and take it on with like a really good attitude, right? And then also pregnancy. As somebody who has worked with pregnant women uh, post, um, postpartum as well as um, throughout their pregnancies, there are a ton of myths around pregnancy. Like pregnancy is not talked about in a, a full scope manner, right? Nobody really shines a light. It's becoming a little bit better these days, but nobody is really shining a light on how your neurochemistry changes after a baby. Nobody's really talking about how your neuro neurochemistry changes while you're pregnant. Like your hormones are all over the place and your brain is affected deeply. So many women experience postpartum depression and I've had so many women be just blindsided by it because nobody talks about it. And so again, I, I would consider that misinformation. I think that should be a more publicly spoken about thing and it is changing, um, but misinformation, that's a flow blocker. So how can you expect to be in flow when basically you've been misinformed your whole life, right? What we don't know, like it just, it kills us. So this is our chance to become informed and to know what's going on with our bodies cultural conditioning. We as a society are told that youth is where it's at. And as we age, we just go downhill, right? And that's really shitty. That's really, really, really shitty, right? So we're always, even if like, even if we aren't personally on a path of, of chasing youth, it is infiltrating us. There is this like, like this cloud that kind of follows us of like, I should be doing this because I should like, I should be wanting to try to look younger and I should be doing injectables and I should be doing this and that, and that all to look younger. And um, 
that is part of cultural conditioning and that's a flow blocker. Um, we as women are told that our bodies aren't, aren't that great, right? We're, we're told to start to like hate little pieces of our bodies, whether it's like the shape of our nose, our eyes. Oh my God, so many women, if you do this, no, no wrong to you, but you know, that your lips are too small, so you need to make them bigger. Same with your breasts, that your thighs are too thick, this and that. We're all taught that our bodies aren't okay the way that they are. That's a flow blocker. We are applauded for burnout. How crazy is that? And this isn't just for women. This is, this is for everyone. Our society is applauded for burnout. You are rewarded for like working your ass off to the point where you are sick, where you can't like, that's crazy. That's totally crazy. There is a different way to do that, which we kind of talked a little bit about in the last lecture of cycle syncing, how if you learn to follow your flow, you can actually increase your production even with having like lower productivity days. We are taught to not trust our female intuition. We as females have superior intuitive capabilities. We just do. They're unmatched. And we are taught to, we're taught that they're crazy. That those thoughts, that those intuitive gut sensations are craziness. And that's something that we absolutely need to change. And that's a hard process to come into but we have to change that. We have to be able to listen to our gut because our gut knows, it does, it just knows. We're of course taught that periods are gross. Don't talk about your blood, don't show your blood. Uh, hide your tampons, hide your pads. Definitely don't talk about like what's going on with your body. Um, I know that in my family, that was never spoken of. I'm one of three, two older brothers. Um, even my mom, like we, she, we never talked about my period ever, ever. Um, and we already discussed this, but we're taught that it's very normal to be pms -y and to be moody and like the little, little like rants that are go that go along with that, um, the little digs, all part of cultural conditioning and all flow blockers. They prevent you from being in your flow. Okay, knowledge is power. So if we can identify these flow blockers, we can start to step away from them. Environmental and lifestyle toxins, endocrine disruptors. So what exactly is an endocrine disruptor? Basically, they're chemicals that interfere with your hormones. Um, they can interfere with many pieces of your hormones, many processes. So the release, transport, metabolism, the elimination. Each endocrine disruptor is different. They don't all affect your hormones in the same way, or they don't all affect your body in the same way, but they do all affect hormones. So endocrine disruptors affect your hormones. Um, they mimic naturally occurring hormones, um, and they can do so by blocking or like interfering with the receptors or with how your hormones are made or how your hormones are released, controlled, those types of things, okay? This is a quick little list of the dirty dozen. And just so you know, I'm still working on a PDF that you can like kind of print and put on your fridge. This, you could take a screenshot and just have. Um, it is not meant to send you running for the hills, if that's the expression. Um, I don't want to instill fear. I just want to build awareness. So we would be out of our minds if we went through our house right now we're like i've got to throw out everything that's an endocrine disruptor but maybe we could start to be more mindful when we do make purchases right so like the other actually just today uh amazon subscribe and save my blonde hair purple shampoo it ran out so you know i have to make a new choice and i just automatically went on and like I caught myself kind of mindlessly just plugging in for a new shampoo. Now I know I want to visit this site. I'll list that site. I want to go to the site and I want to make sure like that I have an awareness of how disruptive this product is. Is it high on the scale or is it actually kind of like right in the middle? Is it low? I just want to start making like more informed choices. It is not realistic. I do not think to think that we could eliminate all of these things from our life. Okay. But just again, can we be a little bit more informed? Um, some of these things like lead, we know that like lead paint 
isn't really, well, lead paint is not used currently today, but lead paint is around. But like, that's something like, we're pretty proactive. It's not being used currently. It is in our water supply. So that's something that we will talk about, but there are certain things that we've got an easier, easier route than others, okay? Um, for somebody who's into hiking and whatnot, one that comes up quite like this is on my mind a lot is PFCs, which are poly, oh, sorry, let's see if I can say this, perfluorinated chemicals. I think I got it. So that's non-stick non -stick cookware and anything that's like stain or water resistant. So I instantly go to um, Gore-Tex, right? And my argument for that is we're not in it every single day. It's not usually directly up against our skin. Usually we've got some type of base layer. We're outside. And I think the most important piece is it's not daily exposure, right? Mattress pads, those are almost always water resistant. Um, you're sleeping on that every single day. That's a very different situation, right? That's a very, very different situation. Um, period underwear, I'm kind of getting ahead because we'll go into this a little bit later, but period underwear, your, your vagina, your, your, that whole area is such a absorbent mucous membrane and to put a PFC directly up against it, I should be saying vulva, but anyways, I got caught up there. Anyways, that is one of the most absorbent areas of your body. And so to have a PFC up against that for one to seven days, I don't know, is that worth it? Like that's one that I'm weighing in my mind. I love my period underwear because they make me feel just like a little bit more carefree, but is it worth it? I, you know, these are things that we just need to have conversations with ourselves over. Um, another huge flow blocker and part of the environmental lifestyle piece is stress. Stress is huge. We all, we know that stress is not great for us, but at the same time, stress is good for us. Stress, we need stress, but when we have a chronic low-grade anxiety, so low-level stress all the time, that's affecting our HPA access, which is your hypothalamus, pituitary gland, and your adrenals. That is your like stress signaling system. It's a very important axis, a very important uh, collection of systems. It regulates digestion, immunity, your mood, libido and energy. And so chronic low-grade stress or chronic low-grade anxiety is going to affect that. And that will absolutely be affecting your hormones. So again, that is a flow blocker. Um, the following pages are going to be a little bit of a review from week one, where we went over signs and symptoms that something is off. Okay. We're also going to though go into where you can focus your attention in order to heal. And just keep in mind that again, over weeks four through seven, we'll dig into each of these pieces. So blood sugar, pathways of elimination and adrenals, we'll like further dig into those. Okay. So here we are with metabolism and stress symptoms. Again, a review. You've seen this list before, but if we can just keep getting at it, right, we can help ourselves nail it down and identify when something something is not where we want it to be. Um, your actions with this are to examine your relationship to stress, right? What happens in your body when you're stressed? What is your body, what is your systemic reaction to stress? Another thing to be thinking about here is just take note of how you feel after you eat, right? Is your energy revamped? or is it actually kind of a little drawn down? Where is your hunger? Are you eating, if you've heard of a satiety scale, this is something I love using with clients who are looking to just kind of tune into nutrition. A satiety scale, 10 being, I am so full, I could vomit. One being, I am absolutely ravenous, I might pass out. Where are you eating? When you sit down to eat a meal, where are you on that scale? That can be like one of the most powerful trackers available to us. If we are constantly eating at like a six, seven, what's our relationship to hunger? Because that's not actually hungry. Hungry would be 
maybe like a two to three and a half, right? That's, that would be the spot to eat. We ideally want to be on after a meal, we want to be around a five, maybe a six. But if we're eating when we're at a seven, then there's a bigger thing going on there. Most likely related to stress, most likely related to some type of coping mechanism. I feel uncomfortable. There's something that's making me feel discomfort. So I'm going to put something in my mouth, right? I'm going to just soothe myself. It's self-soothing, not a bad thing. It works. You're soothed momentarily, but like identifying those kinds of things is super powerful. Okay. Same applies for like, you know, liquids, drinking, smoking, any of those types of uh, behaviors. And that is all very connected to metabolism and stress because your stress response, how you're choosing to cope is going to affect your metabolism. Okay. Um, if something on this list is popping up, you'd want to be looking at your um, ability to regulate blood sugar and your adrenals. Are you getting tired every afternoon? That's also like a big indicator of like the system is overstressed. So if you're hitting that afternoon slump, something in the system, the adrenals are most likely overworked. Okay. Um, some nutrients though, to help support cortisol, which is your stress hormone are going to be vitamin C, magnesium, uh, fish oil, when you buy fish oil, you want to make sure it has EPA and DHA. And I, I used to know this off the top of my head. I can't believe I don't have it written down here. It's quite a bit. I'm going to modify this slide and I'll incorporate it in an email because it is, you should be looking for certain amounts of EPA and DHA. Anything less than that is basically, you're not wasting money, but you kind of are, you want a, you want a certain amount of EPA and DHA. Um, I can't say this next one, but it's helpful. <laughs> Adaptogens. Adaptogens are wonderful, wonderful supportive mechanisms or supportive tools that can help us with stress. Um, two that come to mind right off the bat are ashwagandha and maca. Um, Ashwagandha is a supplement or an adaptogen, I should say, that if you want it to work, you'd want to take it consistently every day. Um, that is one where you can't just like randomly take it. it you really won't feel an effect, but um, ashwagandha helps with your body's stress response. Um, and pretty much everyone could benefit from that. So ashwagandha is a good one. If you're having any hormonal imbalances, if you're in this course, there's a chance you are. Maka is fantastic at helping with that. Okay. And there's this new buzzword, adrenal cocktail. So we're going to get into what that is. Okay. Um, I have been partaking in adrenal cocktails for about two months now, and I love it. And here is what's involved in an adrenal cocktail. So, um, in week six, we'll break this down. I don't want you to worry about that quite yet. If you are somebody who has an afternoon slump, if you are somebody who wants to reach for a coffee at one or needs caffeine all day, just to say that, um, I want you to put this into your day every day around either 10 a.m. and or two or three in the afternoon. Okay. So 10 a.m or two or three in the afternoon, you wouldn't be harmed if you did it at both of those times, but just maybe start with one and see how you feel. I've been doing mine in the afternoon and it is better than a cup of coffee. It's amazing. It, like I can't even, it's since I've cut back on caffeine and I've incorporated this, my afternoons feel so different, so different. If you follow me, I take a lot of little cat naps as well. It's as good as a cat nap. It's so good. So you take an element from each of these categories. So a vitamin C source, a source of sodium. So that's either going to be sea salt or Himalayan uh, pink salt. Source of potassium. Uh, interesting enough, cream of tartar is a source of potassium. So that's why that's on there. Um, but you could do coconut water or aloe vera juice. And then here's where I kind of made it my own. So I've seen multiple things where um, 
different individuals are recommending essentially just a fat so coconut cream coconut milk or half and half or like raw you know raw, raw cow's milk um on my protein mission i decided i'm going to add a bit of whey protein powder and i believe i'm still getting all the benefits of what an adrenal cocktail is supposed to do which is to support your adrenals again we'll go into um a little bit more scientific detail of that in uh week six but it's supposed it like literally nourishes your adrenals which are getting depleted by either 10 a.m or one or two three in the afternoon and this supports them and gives you like literally life energy um so again you'll see here grass-fed whey not everyone suggests that but it's working for me so i put it on there okay all right moving back into this world of like sign symptoms that something's off we've seen this again your pathways of elimination here are signs and symptoms that something there is off um if this is occurring for you you'd be wanting to examine your bowels look at them look at your poop what does it look like um, I did not create a PDF on that, but there are plenty of resources out there on what your poo is telling you. So take a peek at it. Okay. It'll literally tell you what's going on. Okay. Another interesting thing. Are you having a bowel movement within 30 minutes of waking without caffeine? Awesome. Fantastic. Fantastic. Unfortunately for me, the last week and a half, that's not happening. I'm like, what is going on? Like, why is this happening? It might be stress. I'm, I, I'm trying to like navigate that, but I have not had that issue for quite some time. And all of a sudden it's happening. Right. So it's just like a little checkpoint of like, okay, assess something's going on. What is it? You know, um, another sign would be like, has something, have you gotten an outbreak? Are you getting eczema? Is there like a new, like rough patch on your skin? Um, do you all of a sudden have dandruff? Is your hair oilier than it normally is? And if any of these things on this list are happening, you're going to want to start to look at your liver, your gut, and your skin. Again, we're just starting to make those connections of like, where do, like the problem is here. If this is presenting, this is where the problem is. All right. And then we finally have cyclical. So these are our cyclical symptoms. Again, part of cultural conditioning telling us that this is all normal. We should always be experiencing this. Um, we know now, no, it's not normal, uh, but we want to examine our blood. So you'll get a little chart here um, after this lecture on what your blood is telling you. Your blood specifically is telling you what's going on with progesterone and estrogen, okay? So specifically those two hormones, what is going on? Um, from week one, we're hopefully on the path of tracking our cycle. I wanna just remind you to also track your symptoms. So know what is going on, know what your discharge looks like, know when your low back pain starts, know when your headaches arise, know when libido is thriving or when it kind of chills out, right? These are all things, are you cramping, craving, most of these apps have little um, symptom lists that you can track. So just start doing that. Um, and basically, I just sum that up by also um, just recognizing your symptoms leading up to your bleed. Um, so we just also talked about this. And so again, knowing, looking at your blood, looking at poop, looking at the color of your urine, these are all really important ways or easy accessible ways to know what's going on with your health, specifically to your period blood, it'll be telling you what's going on with estrogen and progesterone and if they are not where they should be, okay? So here we are. If you are having brown blood, so it can usually start, or let's say this, sometimes it is common to see it at the start or maybe the end of a cycle, Okay, we're talking about it happening anywhere, anywhere in the cycle. And that's blood stagnation, excuse me, blood stagnation, which usually is a sign of lower progesterone levels. Um, you may also be experiencing a longer luteal phase if you're, yeah, if you're experiencing um, or seeing some brown blood. Vitex is a supplement. You could also hear it called chase tree berry. Okay, chaste tree berry. 
Vitex and Chase Tree Berry are the same thing. Vitex is a supplement that I learned this through Laura Bryden, Dr. Laura Bryden. You do want to cycle off of, just meaning you don't want to take it every single day. So what I do is I my cycle currently is pretty consistent. So um, if I know that my cycle is coming, I don't take it for the five days of my bleed. I just don't take it when I'm bleeding. And once I stop bleeding, I resume. I'm not going to harm myself if I continue to take it. It's not like a toxicity thing, um, but it is, it's good to step off of it and then come back on, okay? If you're experiencing dark red or black clots, this is again, a sign of lower progesterone and could also be elevated estrogen along with congestion in your uterus. Um, I am not quite positive how to say that, but that is a, um, a Chinese medicine herb, Don K, Don Q, I don't know. Um, but that herb, along with uterine massage and acupuncture, if you see an acupuncturist, they most likely would give you that recommended herbal supplement. Those can all help break up the adhesions. So again, the dark red uh, or black clots. So if your blood has just some thickness in spots, that is clotting. And again, that would be related to lower progesterone, maybe possibly elevated estrogen and congestion in your uterus, okay? Um, heavy bleeds, you feel, so what is a heavy bleed? That's like having to change, if you wear a pad or a tampon, you have to change it every hour. You literally feel like you're like bleeding out. Um, this could be a sign of fibroids or polyps. So you would definitely want to check in with a doctor just to see if you could have like a intrauterine um, ultrasound or anything of the sort. Fiber can help dietary wise with your estrogen metabolism, which may help with um, flushing things out. And let's rephrase that. So fiber will help with estrogen metabolism, which will help with excreting excess estrogen, which would, if you have excess estrogen, it may be leading to the fibroids or polyps. You wanna definitely make sure that you're excreting what you're not needing. Um, and then beets and iron rich foods can help replenish. Um, your lost blood really and help prevent anemia. You would also want to incorporate a B12 supplement. I think most of us should be taking a B complex. Um, and that's another one where you want to make sure that there's like 50 milligrams of B6 in there, along with B12 in your B complex. Anything less than that is really not significant enough to make an impact. Short bleed. Your bleed is only a day or two long. That's going to be a sign that estrogen is very low along with progesterone. Okay. They're both really low. This is definitely going to be something that could happen around perimenopause. Um, you know, hormones are definitely dropping at that point. So that would be something like a sign that maybe that is it, where you are perimenopause wise. Um, you could also though, say you're nowhere near the age for that, that could be a sign of a nutrient deficiency or that your adrenals are not functioning the way that they should be, okay? Um, maybe not a surefire way to fix that, but if it is a nutrient deficiency, you could try taking a multivitamin along with omega-3s and um, see if that helps, okay? Um, and then the last piece would be you're bleeding a lot. So you're having like multiple periods throughout the month that could be a sign that your thyroid is not functioning correctly. Um, incorporating an iodine supplement, you do need to be careful with iodine supplements because if you overdo it, you will also impact your thyroid. So you wanna get just the right amount um, plus L-tyrosine, okay? Um, frequent bleeds could also happen around perimenopause, right? Everyone experiences perimenopause and the, you know, the early stages of menopause differently. Some go for stretches of time without a period, and then they'll get like a two-day bleed followed by three days off, but then a seven-day bleed, and it just gets a little, it can get a little wonky. Hopefully though, if you're taking action now, you'll have a more consistent path by the time you get there or are experiencing perimenopausal symptoms. Okay, this is something I wanted to go over. So skincare. 
how do you take care of your skin? I never knew that there should be a change with the phases of my cycle. I had no idea. And it really, like, it all makes sense. I know that like, again, my skin, I get this like hormonal acne right here and it definitely flares up towards the tail end of ovulation into my luteal phase. I didn't know. I know that you're not supposed to touch your skin. I know that, but I didn't know that there's like a time to do like harsher treatments and a time not to based on your skin. So let's get into that. So during your follicular phase, estrogen is on the rise and this is where, so you've just finished bleeding, right? So you've entered follicular estrogen is on the rise and your skin actually is like becoming thick and plump. This is like probably when it's going to look the best. Collagen is higher at this time. Okay. This is the time to do your facials, but more importantly, this is the time to do intense facials, right? So if you're going to do microdermabrasion, if you're going for extractions, anything of the sort that is like pretty intense to the skin, this is the time to do it because your skin is like the most supple, right? Um, you might also want to incorporate aloe vera. Um, this is a natural exfoliant. It does have anti-inflammatory properties, but it's also very moisturizing. Um, you're coming from, we'll learn this, but you're coming from your bleed when your skin is actually the driest it's going to be. So in the first few phases, first few days, excuse me, of your follicular um, phase, your skin might still feel a little dry. Again, it'll get kind of better as it, as you pass through follicular, but um, if it is feeling a little extra dry, aloe vera can help. Um, a biohack, again, just to like help you optimize all things this is the time to do hydro or laser facials, okay? During ovulation, estrogen and testosterone peak. And if you have not properly flushed out any extra estrogen, this is where acne will start to. You'll get that estrogen dominance, right? And truthfully, it could be a little bit of testosterone sticking around as well, but it is actually gonna be more estrogen. Um, Ovulation is when we want to, I'm going to skip right ahead to it. This is when we want to dry brush. You can dry brush throughout your whole cycle. There's nothing wrong with that, but try to make sure you're dry brushing during ovulation. Dry brushing, when we do it, we want to do long strokes towards the heart, right? All towards the heart. I have my own little system. I literally do everything towards my heart. I think everyone's a little different, but long, quick strokes. Um, some days it feels like really, like really intense and other days I really like it. So just like, you know, feel it out for yourself. Um, you can still do facials, but skip extractions. So none of the hard, like pressure on the skin, none of the pinching, none of the breaking of the skin. Clarifying masks are really good at this time as are gentle toners. Um, and when we talk about biohacking, this is where cryotherapy or IV therapy would be a good time to incorporate um, these things, these practices. Luteal phase. So if you had excess estrogen sticking around from ovulation, now you've entered luteal phase where your sebum production, your oil production has increased. And that's a that's just a oh no situation. Oh no, right? Uh, we also have increased inflammation. So again, right in my luteal phase, this whole area just like kind of comes to life. It just, I don't get like massive outbreak, but it's just like everything that kind of lives there dormant just kind of gets a little bigger. And this is why it's increased inflammation. Sebum production has increased as well and lower progesterone, right? So the skin is changing. So our practices should be changing throughout the cycle. Believe it or not, even though sebum production is increasing, this is a great time to be using oil serums. Okay. Fruit enzymes are going to promote skin renewal and regeneration. So a very gentle way of exfoliating essentially without causing any more inflammation. They're also going to add hydration and also promote collagen production. So as we're getting closer to our bleed, collagen production is actually decreasing. Our skin is going to start to be a little bit more thin and dehydrated. So incorporating fruit enzymes, those can be in serums, they can be in masks, moisturizers, those can really help to retain the moisture and like the, the elastin, the collagen in the skin. Good time to do float tanks. If you've never done a float tank, those are quite interesting. 
um, along with body work, okay? Two things that aren't really causing much inflammation, extra inflammation to the body, right? So again, increased inflammation is happening during this time. Why would we ever want to add to it, right? Again, tail end of your luteal phase, we don't want to do high intensity workouts, right? We don't want to add to the cortisol. Cortisol leads to inflammation. We just want to like, just be like, just more chill, more chill. Okay. Something happened there. Did we miss one? There we go. Menstruation. Okay. So this is when estrogen and progesterone drop. And again, make the skin look thin and not only look thin, it like literally it, it does, it thins a little bit and we get dehydrated. Just naturally we get dehydrated. So if we think back to the foods that we like want to try to start to incorporate during each phase, watermelon always pops into my mind. I don't know if it's just like where we are in the seasons right now, but watermelon during your period is so good for you. Uh, there's so many other foods that are also very hydrating, but eating hydrating foods not only is going to help you hormonally, like with the balance of your hormones, but it's also going to help your skin. Everything is connected, right? Everything's connected. Hydrating masks are really, really great to do during this time. Um, don't do anything that's going to strip your skin during this time. Just don't, <laughs> just don't. Um, you can calm any inflammation by using a vitamin C product. It doesn't have to be a serum, um, but um, vitamin C, vitamin C will help with inflammation. Um, and very interesting piece here, after your second or third day of your bleed, it's a great time to hop in a sauna or a steam, okay? You wouldn't hurt yourself if you hopped in on day one of your bleed, but um, yeah, per recommendation of Elisa, it's after day two or three. Okay, this is the part where I almost got through it all, but I'm missing, I think the last four with details on the screen, but I have the details here, okay? So here we are, we're gonna talk about the dirty dozen. I'm trying to make this like as short and simple, um, as digestible as possible, but I do think it's super important to know. All right, so we have BPA. We've all heard about BPA. What does it do? It mimics estrogen. Steps that you can take, make sure your canned food, your bottles, anything of the sort is BPA free. I did not know this, but receipts have, they're printed on thermal paper that is created, lined with BPA, right? So avoid receipts. I know most places, even if you say you don't want a receipt, are printing it. It doesn't matter. I wish they wouldn't print it, but if you're not touching it, then you're not going to get the results of it, right? You're not going to get the BPA. Somebody is, unfortunately, but just try to avoid receipts. And then you want to avoid plastics labeled PC or recycling labeled number seven, okay? Next one is dioxin. Dioxin is actually created through the burning of carbon sorry, let's look this up. Dioxin is chlorine. When chlorine or bromine are burned in the presence of carbon and oxygen, um, it's basically literally everywhere in the American food supply chain. All processed foods have some level of dioxin in them. Um, it disrupts male and female sex hormone sig signaling, which is a major issue. It's huge. Um, one of the ways that you can try to avoid it is buying local, organic, regenerative farmed foods as often as you can. I know it's not realistic. It's super expensive, but as often as you can, okay? Any of these little steps will help. Atrazine. Atrazine um, has been linked to breast tumors, delayed puberty, prostate inflammation in animals, and there are some cases of prostate cancer in humans. Um, scary fact, uh, but just the truth, right? Most of us will die of some form of cancer. And um, men who die of natural causes mostly actually had prostate cancer that was undiagnosed. Um, same with like, it, and we all like, it's just natural. Cancers naturally happen, right? But anyways, we wanna try to avoid it. You can reduce your exposure to atrazine by buying organic and then also filtering water. I will say, Filtering water was one of the like top remedies for all of this or top solutions. So just make sure you're filtering your water. Phthalates. Anytime you see fragrance, it's almost promised that it is a phthalate, right? So yeah, it's wild. Fragrance is on it. You got a room spray. 
unless it's essential oils. Essential oils is different, but if it just simply says fragrance, then it most likely is a phthalate. Okay, so um, again, everywhere. What does it do? It signals earlier death of testicular cells. Um, on average, we have 50 billion cells that die in our body every single day. So cell death is very normal, but this is just signaling an earlier than scheduled <laughs> than it's supposed to cellular death of testicular cells in particular. It lowers sperm count. It decreases sperm motility. So the ability of sperm to travel um, affects the male reproductive system. Okay. That's birth effects. Um, and then for the general population, male and female, male and female, I'm having trouble talking right now, um, increased risk of obesity, diabetes, and thyroid irregularities, okay? So avoid things with just the term fragrance, um, plastic food containers in general, and specifically plastic wrap labeled number three. Percolate, this competes with iodine, which causes thyroid issues. That's me really summarizing this quite a bit, um, but, one way to help yourself with this is to one, filter your water, but then make sure you're consuming enough iodine. Um, iodized salt is a way to do so. Um, I don't personally buy iodized salt, so I buy trace minerals um, and they have liquid iodine. And I actually purchased liquid iodine after reading uh, the period repair manual, I think that's the name of the book, by, Lo by Dr. Laura Bryden um, to help with breast tenderness. So that can be a, if you have breast tenderness, it can be a sign that like something with thyroid is not where it should be, which sure as hell incorporated just a small amount of this thyroid dropper every day and it went away. Really awesome, right? And that could have been simply because I don't eat iodized salt. So like, where else am I getting iodine? Um, I'm not eating a lot of um, sea plants. I know sea plants have it. And I'm drawing a blank on other sources of iodine, but yeah. Okay, fire retardants. They imitate thyroid hormone. So again, here we are in that world of thyroid hormone. Thyroid hormone is super, super important. Okay, so we want to make sure we take care of that for sure. Fire retardants are, again, everywhere. Um, things you can do is make sure your vacuum cleaner has a HEPA filter. If you do have foam furniture, don't reupholster it. Or if you're going to reupholster it, have somebody else do it like have that be a service that you do, okay? Um, I think the suggestion here of don't reupholster it is get rid of it because that furniture itself is fire retardant. Like the foam is fire retardant. So just get rid of it um, if that's an option. And then usually old carpeting, the padding is fire retardant, okay? So if you are doing renovations, again, just for sure make sure you've got the proper you know, um, protective gear on, but maybe also have that be a service that you hire out. I hate to like put that on somebody else, but we're looking to take care of ourselves. Um, lead. We talked briefly about lead for the most part, like lead paint isn't a thing anymore, but it is in our, it's, it's around, it is around. It lowers sex hormone levels and disrupts signaling to the HPA access, which again is the major body's major stress system. Um, so if we're having issues with adrenals and whatnot, let's maybe like, and we've done other things, like we could look at our lead exposure, like how much lead am I getting on a day-to-day -day basis? Arsenic can cause skin and bladder cancer. And then it also messes with hormones, specifically the glutocorticoid system. And that's gonna be a shit show because that helps us process sugars and carbohydrates. So if we're not processing sugars and carbohydrates properly, we're going to run into a plethora of problems. Those problems being weight changes, could go up, could go down. Protein wasting, sarcopenia. Dr. Gabriel Lyons says that we are a society of muscle wasting. We are not a society necessarily of obesity. We are a society of muscle wasting, and that is the truth. Um, it can suppress your immune system. Again, this is if the glutocorticoid system is not functioning properly. Um, osteoporosis, growth retardation, and increase in blood pressure. So that's a doozy. And again, that's because it's how we process sugars and carbohydrates. And then think of our society who eats mostly processed foods, right? Which is mostly sugars and carbohydrates. So if that's not working well, then we're screwed. 
we are totally screwed. Okay. These are the four that I did not get to. So we'll talk about real quick. Mercury. If you eat seafood, for sure, you're going to have mercury exposure. The smaller the fish, the better. The bigger ones, the big, big guys eat all the, all the other guys. Those are the ones that are going to have the highest mercury levels. It's okay to have it every once in a while, but if you are having it often, definitely like go get your mercury levels checked and see where you're at. Okay. Mercury um, will slow hormone signaling and it just, we just don't want that. We want all of the signals to be working exactly the way that they should be. Um, PFCs are, let's see if I got this, perfluorinated chemicals. <laughs> this is our nonstick pans, period underwear, water resistant, stain resistant, found in clothing, furniture, carpets. What does it do? It decreases sperm quality. It decreases birth weight can lead to kidney disease, thyroid disease, again, another thyroid target. Um, and it can also increase cholesterol. All from something so simple, stain resistant, water resistant, like what? So wild. Um, the other thing, the other two are, are organophosphate pesticides. Um, it's gonna decrease testosterone and it alters your thyroid levels, okay? Um, you can avoid this by buying as many organic things as you can. There is the dirty dozen with, or, uh, with foods, right? So anything that has skin that you eat, you usually want to have that be organic. If you peel the skin off, then it's not as much um, of a worry, but if you're eating the skin, definitely make sure it's organic. And then the last one is glycoethers. Um, fun thing here, it shrinks testicles. Hmm, there we go. That's not good. Um, asthma and allergies. And glycol ethers are found in paints, cleaning products, brake fluid, and cosmetics. So again, examining our, like what we're putting on our skin, our biggest sponge is very, very, very important. Um, in the follow-up email and in the on-demand area and the notes, I will link a couple of sites where you can type in your product and it'll tell you a rating. Okay, so that's super, super, super helpful if you want to go down that road. Okay. All right, we're wrapping up. We are a little over, so I apologize. But our homework, some things I want you to think about. Again, none of this needs to be turned into me, but just things to think about. Take a peek at your blood and what is it telling you? Okay. What symptoms, that's typo, but what symptoms do you currently experience? <laughs> and what systems need a little support? Okay, so again, going through those three sets of symptoms for each of your, um, you know, bodily systems, what are you experiencing and where is that telling you to look? Again, in weeks four through seven, we'll go into the nitty gritty of blood sugar, adrenals, and organs of elimination. And that's going to be really all the information that you need to know. We're trying to just break this down into like little bite-sized bits. Um, but look at the systems and just build that awareness. And then finally, can you, with confidence, say where you are in your cycle and what the, does that mean in terms of like your hormone levels? It's okay if you don't know exactly where you are right now. It's okay if you don't know exactly what's going on, but look at notes and just again, start to familiarize yourself, right? Build that awareness. For right now, I'm going to stop the recording. We'll go into any questions. Um, next week, we should be back to our normal schedule of Wednesday at 6.30. And next week we are going into, if I remember correctly, brain is shot, so let's just look here. Next week, your endocrine system. So just knowing the science of how the endocrine system works, which is basically your hormone system. So we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of that. Um, come with any questions that you do have about, or hit me up with questions about the endocrine system prior to that. Um, and yeah, that's it. If you do have questions in the meantime, please reach out. Turning off the recording, I hope uh, this was helpful. And again, reach out with any questions. Now, if I can just find how to stop the recording. <laughs> we'll stop the share, that'll help.